evidence review, probably the most painstaking process an investigator has to go through. Examining and analyzing hours of data you collect to try to find that one piece of irrefutable evidence to prove or disprove the existence of the supernatural at work. Sometimes you find yourself almost willing a doorknob to turn. No? Just me? Anyway, I'm Ken DaCosta, co-host of the Paranormal Channel's Dead Air. And... Nope. And for the next half hour, we're going to present evidence submitted by paranormal investigators and you, the viewing public, that might answer the burning question, do ghosts exist? So, open your minds, think critically, and enjoy these paranormal reveals. What the hell is that? And then to hear a female say a response to a line of questioning that we weren't expecting was was pretty shocking. My name is Chris Blanchett. Um, I'm an investigator. I'm a teacher and I'm a historian. Um, and I worked for the Tiverton Historical Society for a while. And my paranormal reveal takes place in Tiverton, Rhode Island at Fort Barton. All right, Fort Barton is a Revolutionary War site in Tiverton, Rhode Island. It was really developed up on top of a hill that really overlooked Narragansett Bay in 1777, and it really protected a ferry route that brought mainly the troops over into Newport and Bristol. So it was a very important spot throughout its history, and during the Revolution, it was a staging ground for what some would say over 10,000 troops made their way through this area. Uh, Bristol, um, they used that site in the hospital when they had to retreat away when the, when the British successfully took Bristol. Probably late June, July, 1777, when William Barton took about 38 men, known as the Barton Raiders, across Narragansett Bay in, in basically what they call whale boats. And they passed over at least three British frigates without even being seen made their way halfway up between Portsmouth and Newport, walked to Prescott Farms, which is, is still there today, knocked on the door and broke into General Prescott's room and brought him back under arrest. So back in 2008, um, me and a fellow investigator, Dave DaCosta, we, we decided it was a nice day. We never really went into Fort Barton and, and, and investigated um, its history and its legends. Um, so we decided why not? Let's go up there. Let's see if we can get some EVPs. We did not very basic technology at this point. It was just me, him, and our, our digital recorder, um, and, and our knowledge of, of the location. We were sitting in pretty much the open field area behind the big tower. And we said, you know, let's just sit here and, and talk to each other about the revolution, about what happened here and see if we can get some responses from what our focus was, the troops and, and the officers that were stationed there during the revolution. So throughout the night, we decided, you know, what our line of question was going to be. And there was one point where we were kind of, you know, we, we were kind of done for the night. So I, I started this line of questioning around, you know, we haven't heard from you. We haven't seen anything. Are you scared? And, and basically what I was trying to get at was, are, are you too scared to, to, to contact us? Because, you know, here's two guys in the woods and we, we don't know you. Are you scared? And in the clip you're about to hear, um, you'll hear a response after I say, are you scared? And then you'll hear Dave um, ask, do you know General Prescott? Scared. You got it. Do you know General Prescott? And what surprised us was this voice wasn't something that we thought to even address. Scared. You got it. Do you know General Prescott? You know, and, and what was interesting, like all EVPs, is, is when you first get to listen to it. And, and when we heard this and we were reviewing it, I remember that first feeling of, that's definitely not us. That's 
a female. And it's almost responding directly to what I'm saying. I'm saying, are you scared? And you hear, he's got it. He's got it. He's got it. And like I said before, we, we weren't expecting a female. We, you know, we were up there looking for soldiers or, or people who, who were actively involved in the fort. And then to hear a female say a response to a line of questioning that we weren't expecting was, was pretty shocking, especially since it was just me and Dave in the middle of a, a closed off fort at that time. And after going through all that and, and, and really analyzing it, um, we couldn't help, and, and especially myself, we couldn't really help sit back and, and think, who did we make contact with? And, and, and at the end of the day, I really feel, you know, perhaps this is something more contemporary, just the, the way the language was used, um, the way the, the legends and, and myths around the area too, where some people have reported seeing a lady in white walking on the road kind of near where that location is. Um, there's some stories of firefighters seeing, you know, apparitions way deep into the woods. So really, I left this with this feeling of, we need to research this more. We need to look into this more because maybe there's something to this story of this lost lady in, in the woods. And it, it, it really intrigued us. And, and definitely now Fort Barton definitely leaves that imprint in us every time we go back to, to see if we can contact this lady. When I send this to you, you're going to want to go talk to Ben. And so I sent it to him and his reaction was, holy crap. What is that? Hey there, my name is Mark Arvilla. I am a uh, lead investigator and founder of Mass Ghost Hunters Paranormal Society, and uh, also a demonologist uh, recently in the field over the last several years. Uh, and my paranormal reveal took place at the S.K. Pierce Victorian Mansion in Gardner, Massachusetts. Sylvester Pierce was a wealthy businessman who has achieved his fortune as the owner of the S.K. Pierce and Sons Furniture Company. The success of the company and the furniture industry led to Gardner, Massachusetts being known as the Chair City. In the late 1880s, Pierce decided he would build a mansion befitting a man of his public stature. The mansion he created was a marvel for its time. The nearly 7,000 square foot mansion boasted 10 bedrooms and took 100 men a year and a half to build. The hand carved moldings and corners are seen throughout home. Painstaking detail was used to create every inch of this masterpiece from the master bedroom to even the servants' quarters. The guest list was one for the ages, as the home is said to have had hosted the likes of former President Calvin Coolidge, Minnesota Fats, Betty Davis, P.T. Barnum, and Norman Rockwell, while also serving as a well-known meeting place for the Freemason Society. So several years ago, uh, myself and a few friends from another paranormal team called Sons of the Other Side uh, we all got together to just have a recreational investigation of the S.K. Pierce Victorian Mansion. We were just doing a walkthrough uh, of the building, uh, just checking everything out, do our normal tour, you know, have uh, the, the tour guide, Marion, and also the docent of the home take us through and show us, you know, again, maybe some new activity spots, some new things that might be happening in the house. So as we were coming down from, you know, getting our tour of the building and Ben and I were coming down the main staircase, the S.K. Pierce, Ben was behind me. And I remember he, he came running past me and, and saying, ow, 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 as he went by me. And I said, what's the matter, Ben? He said, something poked me. And I said, are you sure? He said, yes. Yeah. So I called him over, I brought his father over, and we lifted his shirt up and on his back, on his left shoulder, he had a red poke mark. And then like two scratches, you know, maybe three scratches on his shoulder from where that poke mark was. And so the scratches came down his shoulder. And I remember, you know, looking at that and saying, that's kind of odd. So the photo that you're about to see was taken in the men's sitting parlor or the front room of the S.K. Pierce Victorian Mansion. Uh, at that time, it was myself and Ben Wheatley, a uh, young investigator. I think he was 18 years old at the time, but his father was there too. Uh, we were together and we were actually walking into the room and everyone else in the room was in front of us. And I grabbed Ben real quick and I grabbed him and I brought him next to me and I said, hey Ben, take a quick selfie. And I snapped a photo with my phone 
on the front facing camera and then you know proceeded to send ben over and then we took some photos with the rest of the group um so the picture that you're about to see is the one with just ben and i so later when we actually looked at the photo we noticed that it wasn't just ben and i in the photo it was ben myself and some bizarre figure behind us So when I initially saw this, it wasn't even until the next day when I was showing the photos on my phone to someone else. I said, here, take a look at the pictures from last night. They were looking at it in the very sec second photo. They go, what's that? And I looked at the picture and I said, I don't know what that is. When I took the photo initially, it didn't jump out at me. Nothing jumped out in the photo that was an anomaly. It wasn't until the next day looking over the photos that I saw that and it stunned me when I saw the picture. Um, I immediately picked up the telephone and called Ben's father, Dave. And when I called Dave, I asked him, I said, geez, how's Ben doing today? And he said, he seems fine. And I said, are you sure? He said, yeah, why? I said, I'm going to send you something. And when I send this to you, you're going to want to go talk to Ben. And so I sent it to him and his reaction was, holy crap. What is that? And I said, I, I have no idea. And uh, so he checked on Ben. Ben seemed okay. Um, you know, my, my, my biggest fear was that maybe something had attached itself to Ben. So I wanted to be sure that he was okay. So when lining this up with the different series of, of events that happened, because then that's what kind of prompted me to grab Ben and be like, come on, Ben, take a picture with me. You know, calming him down. He put his backpack on. I think he was subconsciously trying to protect his back. He had put his backpack on, we snapped this photo. Um, and then of course, you know, the next day finding that anomaly over his left shoulder, which was the same shoulder he'd gotten scratched on. This is some of the things that caused me to need to call his father immediately to make sure that nothing was happening to Ben and that he was cool. I really feel the most mind-boggling thing about the photo itself is that I don't have a basis or, or any sort of an explanation as to what it could possibly be. Um, there were never any cults or anything like that, that to our knowledge that were in the building. And some people have said to me, hey, it looks like a ceremonial cloak. Or, it looks like something that a, 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 you know somebody might have worn during a meeting or something like that. And I just don't know what it could possibly be. Um, I, I've been back several times since then searching for an answer, you know, trying to find out what if anything could be in the home that might cause that. I don't feel that there's truly um, much negativity that happens. I know some people have had some adverse experiences there, but I think that might be due to just the fact that it's such an active location, such a magnet for spirit activity, that things do come and go. Um, and maybe that's just what this is. Maybe we caught something that was just passing through and just happened to be the exact right moment for us to capture it in a picture. So someday, I do hope that this house will yield the answer to me as to what it is that's in this photo. I literally felt chills. In fact, every time this happened, I felt my hair stand up. So it was almost as if I expected the drawer to open. And it did. My name is Susie, and my paranormal experience took place in my home in Hollywood, Florida. I live in a ranch-style home. I do collect antiques. Uh, we moved in here about six years ago, and um, there's nothing really unusual that I can say that stands out other than the fact that um, I do collect antiques. I don't know if that has anything to do with what's happening around here, but um, other than that, everything else is pretty normal. For a couple of weeks leading up to this, I had been feeling incredibly depressed. Uh, I felt a heaviness about me, and so I did a lot of soul searching, a lot of meditating, and even reached out to friends who showed up. Um, and as a result, I wasn't sleeping very good at night. And this particular night, I was tossing and turning, 
woke up around 3.30 in the morning to use the bathroom and I noticed that my drawer was open. So naturally I closed it and went back to bed. And I thought out of the corner of my eye, I saw the drawer open again and um, well, decided to record it. I picked up my cell phone camera and just watched. What happened next was caught on camera. Again, it was around 3.30 in the morning, so the lighting is not very good. But I felt a chill. That was the creepy part. I literally got goosebumps, and then within seconds, the drawer began to open slowly. So as a result, I contacted a couple of friends of mine who do this for a living. And uh, they suggested that the next day I set certain things up and run some tests just to confirm or debunk what's happening. So I took a level and photographed it as well to ensure that the dresser was level both ways. I even did a marble test to make sure that the dresser was level. I checked the drawer inside, outside, behind the drawer, everything was fine. In fact, the clothes in this drawer are literally folded, which really never happens. Um, and so um, I began to try to communicate. I thought, well, I have nothing to lose. Let's see what happens. So I sat there in the daylight with light and the drawer closed and began to wait and record. And after about three minutes, nothing was happening. So I decided to maybe taunt a little bit and almost dare the drawer to move. And uh, towards the end of the video, it actually opened. I know as soon as I cut this off, that drawer is gonna open. I do not wanna cut it off. Are you playing games with me? Can you just open the drawer, please? Just do it. There you go, there you go, there you go. Uh-huh. Thank you. And it opened a little bit and opened a little bit more. But right before that, I must add that I did get goosebumps. I literally felt chills. In fact, every time this happened, I felt my hair stand up. So it was almost as if I expected the drawer to open. And it did. Can you just open the drawer, please? Just do it. Thank you. The very next day, I found a key on my bed, and it happened to be a key that belonged to my parents' old house. I haven't seen this key in years. I don't know how it got there, but it appeared on my bed. So I, I put it in a safe place, and I feel very thankful for the experience, and I totally welcome it. If it ever wants to come back and show me love, I'm all about it. I'm happy about it. What I think was happening here was almost an answer to my prayers. I felt safe. I did not feel threatened. I felt comforted in a way. And I think I asked for that. It was about two weeks on and off. But the feeling I must say was comforting. And now it's gone. I, I saged. <laughs> I saged, but I didn't want this particular feeling to go away, and, and it did. And so now I'm sad to say that I still look for that drawer to open and that feeling of comfort, and um, well, it's not there anymore, but it served a purpose. 
And I absolutely feel like it was an answer to some serious, serious deep prayer, meditation. And um, I must say that if it comes back, I will definitely welcome it. Parents just reached the point where they felt they had to move and they put the house up for sale and they moved. Hi, my name is Angela Artuso and I'm the director of Nothing Paranormal here in New York. Um, my reveal, my paranormal reveal, takes place in Staten Island, New York. The home was probably built around the 1940s. It's your standard cape. Uh, the downstairs has a regular kitchen, eat-in dining room, and living room. And then there are steps going upstairs to the bedroom. There are three, two bedrooms upstairs. There's a children's bedroom and, and a very small little area for the baby's nursery. The home is a detached home. There's about 25 feet on each side of the house before you could get to the next home. We received a call from this family to come in to help them tease apart these complaints that they've been having with their children. They have three boys. Uh, the youngest is about 14, 15 months old at the time. And the two other boys were roughly around age nine and five. So what was happening was the boys could not go to sleep. They were complaining that there was a party taking place in their room every single night around 1, 2 a.m. in the morning. If you woken up from a sound sleep with people jumping on their bed, people dancing around in their room, wanting to play a game with them, uh, they couldn't get rid of the people. People would just jump on their bed and scream and cheer and just like an actual party was taking place in the bedroom. Boys would cry every night. They were petrified. They didn't want to go to sleep. And this was a nightly occurrence. The area that night was just post a snowstorm. Um, when we came in to do the investigation, we found nothing, nothing worthwhile. Um, everything was pretty unremarkable. Basic investigation. We had audio recorders out, our DVR cameras, regular cameras, uh, full spectrum, everything. So um, the one recorder that we had was placed at the top of the stairs and that was right at the entrance of the boys' bedroom. What you're going to hear is us summing up with the mother and father. The boys were not in the house. They stayed with a relative that night. Uh, so it was just us and the parents. And you're going to hear like a party going on. And it's almost as if they're saying they're leaving. You can come out now. There was no way that there was a party going on anywhere. No windows were open. It was five below zero out. It was one, two o'clock in the morning. And we, we just can't explain the clip. Day, we started re doing the uh, review of all our findings and when we got to this one particular audio recorder and heard that clip we were just you know astonished by it because we had no clue what we had captured uh, there were no TVs on in the house no radios and like I said the windows were closed it was one two o'clock in the morning there was no surprise party going on anywhere Nobody was home, there's no, and again, no TVs, no videos, nothing, no radio. We just baffled by the whole, we have, we have no clue what that was that we heard. They captured what the boys were complaining of. They said there was a party going on in their room every night, and we captured a party going on in their room that night.
So we went back to sit down with the parents. Um, we went over to the client's home. We went over all our findings of everything that we did capture. We honestly don't have any explanation for that. We were hoping maybe the parents could shed some light on it. Um, have they heard anything similar to it? Have they had any further experiences with it? But they've never heard anything like that at all. It was almost as if um, there is an intelligent component to this as well as residual. So we we don't know exactly, you know, where it's coming from. We don't know what activated it. The children were right. Whatever it was seems to only want to react with the children, play with the children, and have a party with the children. It was harmless, obviously. It terrified the family. Um, there really wasn't a solution to make it go away. The children continued to have this party taking place in the room every night. And the parents just reached the point where they felt they had to move. And they put the house up for sale, and they moved to another state. But you know, the family's happy, they moved, and um, it's one for the books for us. Was I elated? Yes. Was I puzzled? Probably more so, because I need to know what this is. Does anybody know what this is? I'm Kitsy Duncan. I'm a paranormal researcher. I'm the producer of Oddity Files, the podcast and TV show, and the producer of the new YouTube sensational show, Paranormal Crossroad. My Paranormal Reveal takes place in a rental property in Bloomington, Indiana. This was a house in the city of Bloomington, Indiana. It's a piece of rental property just off the campus of Indiana University. It's usually rented out to college students who want to live close to campus, and it's directly across the street from a large Catholic cathedral. We're called in to help one of the current tenants dealing with the haunting. The Oddity Files crew were in on a back sun porch area when this footage was captured captured on a static GoPro we placed in the hallway after we had seen a shadow figure there earlier in the night. At the time, we were conducting a dowsing rod session and were speaking to the spirit of the tenants, Glenn Hall's deceased grandfather. The only claims of paranormal activity before we had gotten there were all on the floor above where this was captured. And it was said the spirit of a little girl was seen on the second floor. Show yourself to one of us. In the hall. In the hall. Come out of the hall. If so, uncross the rods. As the dowsing rods began to work in the family room, unbeknownst to us, this is caught on our static cam in the hallway between the kitchen and the front door have never captured anything like this before. No IR lights were shooting toward this direction, so there's absolutely no reflection happening at this time. The television is facing no windows, doors, or anywhere else where light could be coming in from another source. This is the only time this happens the entire evening. It almost has a 3D look to it. You can see it emerge at the television, which is unplugged, and then move to the left. We have no explanation for what this could be. Do you have any thoughts? So I'm sitting there going through the evidence, and if you're a paranormal investigator, you know, you're just sitting there. Sometimes you just take the little scrolly bar back and forth and back and forth, because who wants to sit there for 17 hours going through everything? But as I was taking the little scrolly bar back and forth, I'm like, what, wait, what, what is that? And I... I always doubt the evidence I get when I first get it because I'm like, you know, a ghost isn't going to show up for my GoPro. So I, I tried to debunk it every way I could. I took videos of it on my phone and sent it to the rest of the Oddity Files crew and they had no idea what it was. We didn't see with our own eyes on the investigation. I didn't find it till later during evidence review and I have no way to describe what this 
entity was. It's like nothing I've ever seen before in my life. I still, I, my friends and I joke about it. We're like, what is it? What is it? Because nobody knows what it is. Um, was I elated? Yes. Was I puzzled? Probably more so because I need to know what this is. Does anybody know what this is? I still don't really know what this is, but if you add the church across the street with funerals, maybe it's something that came from over there. Um, it, it's a rental home. So Lord only knows what's happened in that place over the years with college students. Are you kidding me? Uh, it honestly, I, I didn't get a very, I don't want to say human vibe. I don't think it was inhuman. I, I don't know. I really don't know, but I love to get back in there. Of course, but I can't because the reason that TV was sitting in a hallway is because the kids moved out the very next week. I would love for you guys to let me know what you think this could be. There were no negative vibes in the house. Everything was hunky dory. Um, I just don't know what it is and I need your help. Well, like I said, hours and hours of review. Well, I'm wrapping up here and nothing, but that's just how it is sometimes. How about yourself? How did you feel about watching these evidence clips? Did it affect the way that you feel about the paranormal? A woman in the woods, an odd photograph, a dresser drawer with a mind of its own, a party from a bygone era, and something apparently trying to get its own TV show. In the end, I don't know about arriving at a destination, but the journey will continue. For the Paranormal Channel, I'm Ken DaCosta, and I need more coffee. Until next time.